Good morning and good afternoon. I'm Dr. Jill Einstein, the Director of Physician Engagement of the MAVEN Project, and I welcome you to the Direct Relief Education Series, a bi-monthly series on a variety of topics for the primary care provider. Today launches the first session with medication management of diabetes and hyperlipidemia. It's my pleasure to introduce today's speakers. Dr. Craig Sador was an assistant professor of medicine at the University of Colorado Health Sciences Center and chief of the endocrine unit at Denver General Hospital. Then after nine years of private practice in endocrinology, he joined Kaiser Permanente Northern California, where he practiced clinical endocrinology for over 24 years and received the Career of Caring Award for exemplary physicians. Dr. Charles Schulman was an assistant clinical professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School until 2016. He is currently a corresponding member of the faculty of Harvard Medical School and a senior physician at the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston. In addition, he's been practicing non-invasive cardiology for a long time. We are also happy to welcome um, as one of our panelists, Dr. George Bando, who has practiced cardiology for 45 years with a special interest in interventional cardiology. He had a clinical appointment at the University of Wisconsin for 25 years while a practitioner at a large multi-specialty clinic. For the past 20 years, he has worked in private practice in the Missoula, Montana area. It's been a pleasure for the MAVEN Project to partner with Direct Relief, and I'd like to briefly tell you about the two organizations. Direct Relief is a nonprofit humanitarian medical assistance organization. Founded in 1948, Direct Relief supports the needs of healthcare providers and their patients worldwide. They ship medicines and medical supplies to over 100 countries in all 50 U.S. states. In the United States, Direct Relief supports about 1,600 health centers, free and charitable clinics, and other safety net providers. In addition to this material support, Direct Relief provides cash funding in the form of grants and awards. If you are not yet partnered with Direct Relief, you can find more information at www.directrelief.org. The MAVEN Project is a telehealth nonprofit that supports primary care providers working at safety net clinics across the country. Our experienced volunteer physicians offer provider to provider medical consults, one-on-one -on -one mentoring and medical education sessions. Um, and if you are a clinic that is interested in getting this wraparound support for your primary care providers, please go to our website at www.mavenproject.org. So I'm pleased to move on to the presentation today. And Dr. Sudur, I'll have you go ahead and share your slides and feel free to begin. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Einstein. And uh, um, hello to everyone. Appreciate everyone's participation. And uh, for my part, I could not do this without Dr. Einstein overseeing it. And um, our great IT folks, Ryan and Jonathan and Kristen Talbot, who works with the clinic. So they do the hard part and uh, help direct us. So today I was going to talk about type 2 diabetes, when to give which medicines. And so with type 2 diabetes management, just as an overview, there's the medical nutrition therapy, which a registered dietitian can be very helpful. Weight reduction for the patients who are overweight or into the obese range. Exercise, medications, working with a diabetes educator can be invaluable. And bariatric surgery has a place for many patients with type 2 diabetes. But today we're going to limit it to medications. And with this, for the agenda for choosing choice of uh, various medicines for people with type 2 diabetes, it would depend on if they had atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease or if they had high risk for development of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, if there was heart failure, if they had chronic kidney disease, if there were particular hypoglycemia concerns, or if there were cost concerns that have um, been a practical issue for so many of our patients. And lastly, if there are hyperglycemia-related catabolism present. So this will help direct where to go with medicine choices. Now, with type 2 diabetes or blood glucose-lowering medicines, the overview was much simpler in the old days. There was 
metformin. And if that didn't do the full job, you go to a sulfonylurea. And if you still needed um, benefit to get the glucose down, you bring insulin into the regimen. Currently, fortunately, there are even more options. Metformin is still often the first choice um, because of multiple benefits. But there is now the choice of other medicines based on comorbidities, if the patient is overweight, uh, A1C lowering targets, risk of hypoglycemia, cost, and symptomatology. And there's now been a move toward preference of, when possible, simplifying medication regimens, such as the once-weekly glucagon-like protein-1 receptor agonist. This is a very busy slide, and I'm showing it to you for a couple of reasons. One is Dr. Einstein will be uh, giving it to you as part of the slide set, so you'll have it as a reference. And the second is just to look at where we're going in the topic. So on the column on the left, you have metformin, the sodium glucose co-transport, co-transporter 2 inhibitor medicines, the GLP-1 receptor agonist, and then all the way down to insulin. And, oops, excuse me. And then on the row on top, we've got the, how efficient, effic uh, efficacious they are, um, how likely they are to cause hypoglycemia, weight issues, cardiovascular effects, renal issues, and other considerations. So it'll be there for you as a reference. So one thing the American Diabetes Association in its regular updates has talked about is therapeutic inertia, which is worth asking if a given patient um, would fit that criteria. In other words, we've seen this, and this is a direct quote from them. Medication regimen and medication taking behavior should be reevaluated at regular intervals, let's say every three to six months, which is a convenient time to check the A1C anyhow, and adjust it as needed to incorporate specific factors that impact choice of treatment. So in other words, we've all seen patients who kind of plug along month after month, year after year, and it's, it's worth just taking a step back and going, what could be done differently to improve this patient's care? Here is another busy slide that's an overview of what we're gonna talk about today and sort of dive into it. This comes from the American Diabetes Association and it's published every January. And it's the pharmacologic treatment of hyperglycemia in adults with type two diabetes. It starts with the first line therapy. And it again, now depends on comorbidities, patient-centered treatment factors, cost, access consideration. Patients may not have access to certain medicines. Um, and it typically starts with metformin. But a word on lifestyle. Lifestyle modification is important. As Dr. Ann Peters of the Department of Endocrinology, University of Southern California has said, you can, you can eat your way out of various therapies. So lifestyle medication, lifestyle is an important um, coexisting treatment modality with pharmaceutical um, approach. So here, and this is new, this is in the last relatively recent past, we're not automatically going to lower sugar. We're looking first at comorbidities. So here you have the atherosclerotic cardiovascular, dis cardiovascular disease. Do they have it or do they have high risk factors for it? And heart failure and chronic kidney disease. So you're looking at this, and so many of the patients with type two diabetes have one or more of these comorbidities. And if so, it gives a pathway to choose medications. Here, we have the GLP-1 receptor agonists that have proven cardiovascular disease benefits. So they've done numerous studies. And if you have patients with type two diabetes and known cardiovascular disease, the cardiovascular disease outcomes decrease with liraglutide, injectable semaglutide, and dulaglutide when compared with um, placebo. There's a couple of others like lixacenatide and extended disease, uh, exenatide and oral semaglutide who don't seem to have that decrease as of yet as far as evidence. But with the other ones mentioned, the liraglutide, injectable semaglutide, and dulaglutide, 
outcomes improve. So it's not just lowering sugar, it's improving cardiovascular disease outcomes. With heart failure, the bottom line is, as of yet, GLP-1 receptor agonists have not been shown to have benefit. Doesn't mean they don't, but there's no evidence at this point. So atherosclerotic disease, yes. Heart failure, as of yet, no. Now, looking at the GLP-1 receptor agonists in type 2 diabetes as far as microvascular, the caveat that's mentioned was these trials were designed to look at cardiovascular outcomes um, rather than the microvascular disease. But lo and behold, in the studies, it was shown that liraglutide, semaglutide, and dulaglutide all reduced the nephropathy outcomes. It, imp it, it improved the long-term picture. Injectable semaglutide, however, was shown to increase retinopathy outcomes, whereas dulaglutide decreased them. So it's a word of caution with injectable semaglutide. If you have a patient who has, let's say, existing retinopathy, this would not necessarily be the GLP-1 receptor agonist to go to. And with moderate to severe chronic kidney disease, dulaglutide attenuated the kidney disease progression. So you can sort of keep people more in place than the um, concerning progression of renal insufficiency. With GLP-1 receptor agonists, type 2 diabetes and all-cause mortality has been evaluated. And we've seen studies where drugs were beneficial in one particular place, but the all-cause mortality may actually increase. So that's now part of the um, analysis for looking. And it turned out that GLP-1 receptor agonists, including liraglutide, semaglutide, exenatide, lixacenatide, all appeared to decrease the overall mortality with type 2 diabetes and established cardiovascular disease. So that was additional reassuring information. Weight loss. Well, with the GLP-1 receptor agonists and type 2 diabetes and weight loss, there's a lot that's been written in the lay press. A lot of patients um, have been researching it and they'll approach us with this. And it turns out that dulaglutide, exenatide, liraglutide, and lixacenatide all have shown reduction in weight compared with placebo. A slightly greater weight loss with injectable semaglutide compared to dulaglutide, liraglutide, and extended release exenatide. But again, the injectable semaglutide, there's a concern about um, retinopathy progression. And there's more weight loss with the daily oral semaglutide compared with daily liraglutide. And, and the oral semaglutide is the only oral form available at this point of the GLP-1 receptor agonist. So here's a list for your reference for the GLP-1 receptor agonist using the generics and the brands. You've got the short-acting uh, cutaneous ones that are given daily, the long-acting uh, subcutaneous that are given weekly, and then the oral on the bottom semaglutide, like I mentioned. Um, there are caveats. So it's best to avoid using GLP-1 receptor agonists if you have a patient with type 1 diabetes. Um, past pancreatitis, um, this would be a patient that you'd be concerned about. Creatinine clearance of less than 30 for exenatide and uh, the estimated glomerular filtration rate less than 30 of lixacenatide. But the other GLP-1 receptor agonists can be used with uh, more renal insufficiency. Severe GI disease such as gastroparesis that plagues some of our patients with diabetes. Exenatide and lixacenatide would not be recommended. But even in the others, watch for nausea. Um, it's possible, and that's why, um, just to be cautious. Now, with a past history or a family history of medullary carcinoma of the thyroid or multiple endocrine neoplasias type 2A or type B, liraglutide, dulaglutide, extended release xenotide, and semaglutide, either form oral or injectable, um, would not be a go-to choice. But this may be overplayed. Um, there's a lot of investigators who have sort of taken a step back and looked at it. Um, it's definitely an issue in rats, um, but in humans, it's not as clear. But if you have a patient with medullary carcinoma thyroid, which is fortunately rare, um, 
consider going to another class of medicines at this point. Now, looking at the glycemic effects, so we're finishing talking about the GLP-1 receptor agonists, and as far as the sodium glucose co-transporter 2 inhibitor ones, how well do they stack up with lowering blood sugar? Well, they do decrease the A1C, the SGLT2 inhibitors by 0.4 to 1.1% and the GLP-1 receptor agonists a little more by 0.5 to 1.4%. And it tends to be the higher the initial A1C before the patients start on the medicine, the more the drop in A1C. Each is often an add-on agent. Typically you have a patient with metformin uh, like you saw on the left part of that chart with the ADA, but it can be used as a monotherapy and it would be a consideration. Let's say you have a patient with a pretty good A1C, let's say 7.5 and you'd like to get it down, but this is a patient with, let's say, a history of myocardial infarction. This would be a consideration of going to one of these agents even before metformin, um, but metformin is certainly part of the uh, regimen for so many patients. With the SGLT2 inhibitor, there are cardiac benefits, which have been um, happily found. Empagliflozin and canagliflozin both decrease atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease morbidity and mortality in patients with coexistent type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease. With patients who have type 2 uh, diabetes and heart failure, all of the uh, SGLT2 inhibitors have been shown benefit, especially if there's heart failure with reduced ejection fraction with the left ventricular ejection fraction of under 45%. And in looking at the SGLT2 inhibitors with chronic kidney disease and mortality benefit, impact glifloson, canagliflozin, dapagliflozin, all have been shown to reduce diabetic kidney disease progression. And canagliflozin and dapagliflozin have reports, unfortunately, of acute kidney injury, rare but present, and have led some patients to require hospitalization and dialysis, so at least to inform the patient of the possibility of the risk. Canagliflozin, dapagliflozin, epagliflozin, urtagliflozin, and sotagliflozin, tongue twisters, all have decreased overall mortality with type 2 diabetes and established cardiovascular disease, so heart benefit, kidney benefit. But as with the uh, GLP-1 receptor agonist, you want to avoid the SGLT2 inhibitors if there's type 1 diabetes. If there is renal insufficiency, and here you can see the EGFR under 60 for or 2 glyphosin and under 45 for dapagliflozin, under 30 for canagliflozin. Basically, um, when you're seeing under 45 you really want to go to another category. The, the medicines just don't work in that um, scenario. So not, not um, a good choice for these patients. If there's a past diabetic ketoacidosis or risk, someone with pancreatic insufficiency or drug and or alcohol addiction, this would be a concern, probably best to avoid it. Um, there is a low risk in type 2 diabetes for these patients um, with uh, ketoacidosis. So alert them if they start to develop uh, nausea and respiratory symptoms, you know, to seek medical attention right away. Bacterial urinary tract infection or genital urinary yeast infection. So if you have a patient who's been prone to um, candida, menelial, uh, vaginitis, or balanitis, probably best to avoid this category of medicines. If you have a patient with low bone mineral density and a high risk for fracture and falls, um, this would be a potential concern. And if you have a patient who globally is a risk for foot ulcer, let's say peripheral neuropathy, foot deformity like a Charcot joint um, disease, peripheral vascular disease, or a history of previous foot ulceration, it's best to avoid because there is a, a slight increased risk of amputation with SGLT2 inhibitors. So it's best to select the patient first. So if there's a high risk for developing a lower extremity disease, look elsewhere for treatment. So here's a list for the SGLT2 inhibitors, listing them by uh, generics in their um, brand names. 
um, back to the um, chart. So if you've exhausted these med uh, medicines on the left with the um, comorbidity and you still want A1C control, um, you will go up toward this area. Or if they never had these comorbidities, you could start with these areas. So you're looking at how you can get the A1C down. And the GLP-1 receptor agonists work a little better than the other ones. So if you wanna minimize hypoglycemia, we're always concerned about hypoglycemia, but let's say you had an elderly patient with um, significant dementia. This would be a patient who you definitely would not wanna have uh, significant hypoglycemia. So you would go to GLP-1 receptor agonist, SGLT2 inhibitor, et cetera. If you have a patient where weight is a major issue and uh, yeah, let's say obesity, and this is a patient who's been gaining weight anyhow, or let's say severe obesity with BMI 40 or greater, the GLP-1 receptor agonist has the best track record for weight loss, but SGLT2 inhibitors also. If cost is an issue, like unfortunately it's with so many patients, um, there is sulfonylureas. If you're going to do it, go to one of the newer ones like glipizide. There's thiazolidine dione, like pioglitazone, and there's insulin, but not the analog insulin. We're talking human insulin. These are going to be the least expensive. But look what coverage your patient could get, uh, Medicaid, or if there's certain benefits in that particular geographic area with insurance, um, there may be one category that uh, medicine of each category that's available. So, the one thing the chart doesn't do is about thinking insulin therapy, which is if you have catabolic symptomatic issues, you have significant weight loss, unintended, polyuria, polydipsia, if there's ketonuria, if there's severe hyperglycemia, fasting plasma glucose over 250 or random plasma glucose over 300, or if the A1C is greater than 10. So lowering it by one and a half for a patient who has, let's say, an A1C of 14 is just not going to do it. Go to insulin sooner rather than later. And if diabetes type one is a possibility, insulin definitely. So in summary, um, comorbidities, practical issues, hyperglycemia severity would direct treatment for which type two medication to choose. And in conclusion, glycemic control is definitely important, particularly with microvascular, you know, helping the eyes, helping the kidneys but so is selecting a treatment to improve outcomes of type two related complications. Um, this is an app that comes from the Endocrine Society. It's for clinical um, practice guidelines and it's a variety of fields, adrenal, bone, et cetera, but also has diabetes. It's free of charge. You don't have to be a member of Endocrine Society um, and you can do interactive. You can put in some simple detail like patient's age, um, EGFR, and then you, they can give you a suggestion of medic medication to use. And it's so easy to put on your smartphone, even I could do it. These are the resources. This is the American Diabetes Association. They came out with their yearly one. It usually comes out in January. It's free of charge. You don't need to be a member of the American Diabetes Association. And on the bottom is the um, link that you can do to get on for their website. And with that, I will stop sharing and turn it over to Dr. Schulman. Dr. Sador, thank you so much for packing in all of that great information. And Dr. Schulman, you can go ahead and share your slides. And just as a reminder to all of our listeners, um, for any of your questions, please utilize the Q&A icon that's on your Zoom toolbar if possible. Um, it's a little bit easier for us to track the questions um, for the end of our talk, but feel free to ask any, you know, a question that might be a little question or more complex, or if you have a particular case, um, you know, question that you want to ask about. Okay. Uh, good, uh, good afternoon where I am and good morning to those of you uh, further west uh, that, uh, 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 the, the, the cl that the clock has not passed noon. Um, uh, this is uh, um, my version of the medication management for hyperlipidemia. Why is this not working? Oops. 
okay, uh, okay. here we go, sorry. Uh, so the, ma the management of dyslipidemia, uh, again, starts with therapeutic lifestyle um, uh, measures, uh, uh, dietary approaches, uh, such as uh, illustrated at the on the left uh, down bottom left uh, with with um, uh, Mediterranean style diets, uh, emphasizing fruits and vegetables, uh, uh, healthy uh, proteins, uh, and uh, uh, things like uh, olive oil, um, and also exercise. Uh, and uh, what I've done here is uh, written the exercise prescription. Uh, on, a, on a prescription pad. Uh, sometimes that impresses a patient. Um, uh, the exercise prescription uh, consists of several uh, uh, aspects, the frequency, the intensity, uh, and the duration. Uh, and don't forget a warm up and a cool down. Now turning to the drug treatment of dyslipidemia, um, uh, the first uh, three out of uh, three or more really, uh, out of uh, five uh, choices are statins, statins, statins. Um, uh, those should be your choices, numbers one, two, and three. Um, of the non-statins, uh, azetamibe and the PCSK9 uh, inhibitors. Okay, uh, these are the, this is the benefit-risk ratio for the statins. And the benefits of the statins are uh, really very, very well known, have been proven over and over again in randomized controlled trials and lead to a reduction in LDL uh, levels, a regression of coronary atheroma, uh, and most importantly, a reduction in atherosclerotic uh, events. Uh, the risks, uh, they far out, these benefits far outweigh the risks, and we'll talk about the, the risks uh, a little bit later. Um, the, uh, much of what I, I will recommend here uh, comes from the ACC AHA guidelines, uh, which were published in 2018 uh, as the second version of those uh, particular guidelines. And the guidelines uh, point out uh, different intensities uh, of statin treatment. Um, uh, so high intensity uh, statins will lower the LDL uh, by more than 50%. Moderate intensity will lower it somewhere between 30 and 50%. Low intensity statins are really not, uh, not uh, uh, encouraged or advised uh, unless a patient can't tolerate anything higher. Uh, the high intensity statins are atorvastatin 40 or 80 milligrams, rosuvastatin 20 or 40 milligrams, uh, and the moderate intensity statins are uh, lesser doses of those same two drugs uh, or simvastatin 20 to 40 milligrams. Uh, the, the data for uh, azetamibe uh, uh, and uh, long-term outcomes comes from a study called Improvin. Uh, in the Improvit study, uh, in the Improvit study, this goes back a number of, back to, uh, you know, 20 years, um, uh, atorvastatin 80 milligrams was superior to, to pravastatin 40 milligrams in reducing uh, uh, death or major cardiovascular events. Uh, in the improvement study, uh, uh, simvastatin 40 milligrams was compared with simvastatin 40 milligrams plus azetamide 10 milligrams. Um, and as you can see, there's a benefit to uh, the combination uh, which is statistically significant um, in that in this particular setting, which was a post-acute coronary syndrome setting. Um, the PCSK9 inhibitors uh, 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 work uh, on inhibiting PCSK9, which is a ser uh, serine protease uh, produced in the liver uh, and leads to the degradation of hepatocyte LDL receptors, leading to increased LDL, uh, LDL levels. So the monoclonal antibodies that inhibit the PCSK9 uh, reduce LDL in a dose-dependent manner, and I'll show you uh, the, the amounts in, in just a minute. Uh, they are injectable uh, every two or every four weeks, and, and cost is a major factor. It continues to be a major factor. 
the list price uh, uh, for Rapatha, as you see here, uh, as as uh, quoted in there on in their literature, uh, uh, but it's covered by most insurances, uh, so that copays are much more reasonable, uh, uh, less than fifty dollars a month, uh, in and for most insurances, uh, but for Medicaid, uh, it's less than ten less than ten dollars a month. Uh, and these, this is the, the, the basic data uh, on which these drugs were approved. So this is uh, uh, evolocumab or Rapatha uh, in the four-year study showing a statistically significant reduction of a combined endpoint, which included cardiovascular death, my MI stroke, uh, hospitalizations for unstable angina and coronary revascularization. So it's a combined endpoint and the individual endpoints were also uh, reduced. Uh, this is the, from the Odyssey trial, uh, a series of trials, really, uh, uh, with uh, alirocumab or praleoin, and uh, these results are uh, similar. Um, and this gives you a sense of the uh, intensity of lipid lowering, which you can achieve with the various uh, medications. So as I've already said, a moderate intensity statin will lower the LDL about 30%, a high intensity statin about 50%, a high intensity statin plus ezetimibe about 65%. A PCSK9 inhibitors alone uh, will low, lower LDL by 60%, 75% uh, when added to a statin and 85% when added to a statin plus ezetimibe. Um, now, in the guidelines, uh, I just stop for a minute and, and show you the, um, uh, the, uh, basically the, the definitions of the class of recommendation. Uh, uh, cl a class one recommendation is a, uh, the benefit is much greater than the risk. It's a strong uh, benefit and the, dr and the uh, uh, drug or device or procedure is recommended. Uh, class 2A is a moderate benefit, greater than risk, and uh, it's, you know, can be thought of as being reasonable or can be useful and, and effective. Class 2B is a much weaker benefit. Uh, it may be reasonable to consider. Class 3, uh, don't do it. <laughs> that is, uh, the drug is either not effective, not recommended, or it may be harmful. Um, so, uh, there are uh, two uh, categories, if you want to call it that, of, rec of recommendation for uh, 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 prevention uh, in, in, in our patients, the uh, primary prevention and secondary prevention. Secondary prevention is patients who have already demonstrated clinical evidence of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. And in such patients, uh, the recommendation is to lower the LDL with a high intensity statin or whatever the maximally tolerated uh, level of statin is. Uh, the more it's reduced, the greater will be the benefit. Uh, and uh, for the secondary prevention, um, uh, one uh, seeks to achieve an LDL uh, cholesterol of uh, less than 70 milligrams per deciliter. Uh, I might uh, in, it, add at this point that although it's not a recommendation of uh, these, these guidelines, which came out three years ago, but it is a recommendation of the European guidelines that just came out uh, to lower the LDL grade less than 55. Uh, and uh, the reason one can do that is basically to use the uh, yeah, PCSK9 inhibitors. Now, <clears throat> The guidelines um, uh, also define something called a very high risk uh, ASCVD. The, the definition of very high risk ASCVD is somebody who's had a, an acute coronary syndrome within the past 12 months uh, or has a history of an MI uh, uh, stroke or has symptomatic peripheral arterial disease. Uh, or you can have uh, uh, one, major, one major, major event plus a high risk condition, uh, older people, um, uh, familial hypercholesterolemia, uh, diabetes, hypertension, uh, CKD, uh, or people who are current smokers. Um, and this is the algorithm uh, as published uh, in the 2018 guidelines. Uh, 
So for a patient with clinical ASCVD, uh, start with uh, lifestyle recommendations. In the very high risk, recent, recent acute coronary syndromes uh, or acute MI, uh, a high intensity uh, statin as, as a class one indication. If one cannot achieve uh, an LDL of uh, 70, uh, adding azetamide uh, carries a class 2A recommendation. Uh, if you then consider uh, PCSK9 inhibitor, add azetamide first uh, before adding the PCSK9 inhibitor. Uh, for those who are uh, at high risk, but not very high risk, uh, for patients under 75, uh, the recommendations really are quite similar. Uh, high intensity statin, um, uh, uh, add azetamide, um, uh, and uh, if not, then if not, uh, uh, you, you've not reached a goal, um, add a PCSK9 inhibitor. For age over 75, the recommendations are less uh, secure, if you want to call it that. Um, that is, they're 2A recommendations as opposed to class 1 recommendations. Uh, certainly, if a patient's already on a statin, uh, you should, uh, in general, continue the statin. Um, but uh, initiating a statin um, uh, at, at uh, moderate or high intensity is uh, reasonable. Uh, you might want to consider uh, starting at a, a lower dose and, and then titrating up. But uh, don't let therapeutic inertia keep you from titrating to uh, 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 these uh, higher doses. Uh, for primary prevention, uh, the, the recommendation is to assess the risk and then, and then again, emphasize adherence to a healthy lifestyle. Uh, this is an app which is uh, available on your uh, uh, cell phone, uh, which can be uh, very helpful for use uh, uh, in, in the clinic uh, to assess the uh, atherosclerotic risk uh, uh, of, of your patient. Uh, and then once you've assessed that risk, uh, these, these would be the categories of risk. So less than 5% is considered to be a low risk. And for those patients, emphasize lifestyle to reduce risk factors. For patients uh, at the, whoops, sorry, at the other end of the spectrum, greater than 20%, that's considered to be high risk. And uh, those people should be on a moderate uh, 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 a moderate or high dose of a step. Well, high, really, initiates that and to reduce LDL by more than 50%. That's a high dose. Okay. Between five and seven and a half percent is considered borderline, and between seven and a half and 20 is considered to be intermediate. And here the recommendations are not quite so firm. Unless you have these, they have risk enhancers, and I'll show you those right here. The risk enhancers uh, are family history, a persistently elevated LDL of uh, greater than 160, uh, CKD, metabolic syndrome, certain conditions in women, uh, and inflammatory diseases, uh, or persistently elevated triglycerides. So uh, in, in these cases, your, your choices become uh, uh, if the, if the uh, ASCVD risk is greater than seven and a half uh, percent, you can just go ahead and start a, start a stat. Uh, uh, but, but these all come with, with uh, or not with, but after a discussion with the patient uh, uh, for not only informed consent, uh, but shared decision making and getting the patient's point of view. I have patients who, who have family histories uh, who have uh, risk uh, calculated in this area. And some patients will say, I'll take the medicine uh, and other patients say, I'd rather not. So the, you need the patient's opinion in all of this as well. Um, now, um, the, uh, the, again, go, moving on with primary prevention. If, you're, uh, if the LDL is greater than 190, no risk assessment is necessary because these people almost surely have familial hypercholesterolemia, uh, either heterozygous or homozygous. And so high intensity statins are, are indicated in a with a class one recommendation. 
If your patient has diabetes and is between the ages of 40 and 75, again, uh, uh, statins are indicated, starting with a moderate dose, but consider a high dose if the, uh, if the risk is high. Uh, for age over 75, uh, clinical assessment is necessary and a risk discussion. Uh, they made no definite uh, uh, recommendation. Uh, my sense of it is give the statin. Uh, considering that at that age, uh, a third of people will die from uh, atherosclerotic coronary uh, cardiovascular disease. Uh, and so there's, there's a lot to prevent, right? The, 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 the amount of, you know, <laughs> the bang for the buck, if you will, uh, with a, a high risk is much greater than it is with a low risk. Um, there are diabetes-specific risk-enhancing risk factors, including having had it for more than 10 years uh, if type uh, 2 diabetes or more than 20 years for type 1, uh, albuminuria or CKD uh, class 3, uh, retinopathy, neuropathy, uh, and uh, an ABI of uh, less than 0.9 uh, indicated uh, peripheral arterial disease. And these are the recommendations uh, that are contained in the standards for medical care for diabetes uh, that uh, Dr. Sadur uh, <clears throat> uh, mentioned uh, earlier. Uh, for patients under the age of 40 who do not have other risk factors, there is no specific recommendation. Um, for uh, patients, oh, I'm gonna, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna get a laser pointer. Uh, for if, if patients are under 40 but have other uh, uh, risk factors, initiate statin therapy. For patients over the age of 40, either with or without other uh, uh, risk factors, uh, moderate intensity uh, statin is indicated. Uh, so the Diabetes Association and also the, AC, the American College of Cardiology and Heart Association are recommending the same thing here. Uh, if there are multiple risk factors, uh, uh, I use a high dose of statin. Uh, add azetamibe if, if the lipid lowering that you achieve is less than 50%. Uh, they don't make a specific recommendation for the PCSK9 inhibitors, but they do point out that the absolute, re absolute reduction of uh, uh, adverse events uh, is greater for diabetics than it is for pre-diabetics than it is for people without diabetes. What about hyperlipidemia? It's a common question I get. Um, uh, if you have a patient with a, a, a triglycerides of greater than uh, 500, uh, uh, especially greater than 1,000, uh, then you're getting to the area where uh, 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 pancreatitis is a risk. And therefore, uh, treatment should be aimed at trying to prevent pancreatitis. Lifestyle measures uh, add uh, fibrate and or fish oil and or statin to lower the triglycerides. Um, between 175 and 499, again, address lifestyle factors, secondary causes, and medications which might raise the uh, triglycerides. Um, uh, uh, in patients who have uh, ASCVD and have a triglycerides between 135 and 149, uh, it's been shown, uh, there has been a benefit shown by adding icosapent ethyl, which is uh, Vasipa. Uh, uh, these people should continue to be uh, monitored uh, uh, as, as should the diabetic parameters as mentioned by Dr. Sadur. Um, uh, the diet, uh, measure the lipids regularly, uh, uh, at least in part to check the adequacy of the statin therapy and to check adherence. You know, a patient who has an LDL of uh, uh, 70 at one visit and 140 at the second visit isn't taking his medicine. Um, uh, so review adherence at every, at every visit and review safety issues uh, that may come up. And so these are the, the adverse effects that have been reported with uh, statin therapy. There are a whole group of them. Um, uh, <laughs> Uh, there's no, in, there's no uh, evidence for cataracts, uh, stroke, uh, uh, the evidence for uh, effect of statins on cognition uh, is, uh, is anecdotal. Uh, the effects, uh, there are uh, no, no real clinical, clinically relevant effects uh, on the liver, except uh, extremely rarely. Um, 
uh, new onset diabetes is a, is a uh, risk, uh, and people with a metabolic syndrome or prediabetes would be uh, more likely to uh, uh, have uh, to go on to uh, full blown diabetes. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll share with you a consultation that I had with Dr. Sadur <laughs> recently, and that is that there aren't any endocrinologists that would fail to prescribe a statin for it because of this fear. Um, now, the commonest side effects from statins are the muscle-related symptoms, and it's, 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 it's highly debated as to whether these are uh, real or not. Uh, there are certainly, uh, the, in, in the double-blind studies, the incidence is very low. And in the double-blind studies, the incidence is roughly compared to uh, the uh, uh, development of symptoms uh, in the placebo group as well. Uh, observational studies are another, another matter, and clinical practice is another matter. Um, <clears throat> so how do you manage uh, somebody with uh, satin-associated muscle complaints? So if your patient uh, complains of uh, symptoms or fatigue during statin therapy, Stop the drug, draw CK. If the CK is negative, then you don't have to worry about rhabdomyolysis. Um, uh, you should obtain some kind of a baseline history of uh, prior uh, or current muscle symptoms, um, and then wait for the symptoms to subside. The quicker they subside, uh, the more likely it will be that they're related to the statin. If you stop the statin for a month and the patient still has symptoms, even though they're reduced, I think it's probably not the statin. Uh, and then consider other uh, conditions which might raise the risk of muscle symptoms, such as hypothyroidism, vitamin D, and vitamin D deficiency. Um, then you can either rechallenge the same statin, perhaps at a lower dose, or switch. Uh, pravastatin and rosuvastatin have different um, metabolism than simvastatin and atorvastatin and may be tolerated when simva and atorva are not. Uh, and as a matter of fact, I have used uh, rosuvastatin as my uh, secret weapon. Uh, I'll tell people to start it once a week uh, and then uh, titrate up as long as it's tolerated and almost always it is. Uh, and then the third, the uh, alternative is to use non-statins. Azetamiveloma isn't very effective, but the PCSK9 inhibitors are. Um, and I, I share with you two of my patients, uh, a 51-year-old man with a history of hypertension, gout, and a family history of premature coronary disease. We took care, uh, my, my colleague uh, took care of uh, him and his father uh, when he uh, developed uh, premature coronary disease. And he did not, uh, 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 Sean did not tolerate any, uh, any of the statins on multiple occasions. Uh, his baseline LDL was 190, uh, and he was placed on uh, Repatha. Uh, and uh, as you can see, uh, had had a very uh, nice effect on his uh, LDL. Uh, this is uh, John. A uh, 75 year old man who had an acute, his first acute MI at age 48. Uh, so, premature coronary disease. Uh, and eventually had a cabbage in 2013, eight years ago, uh, uh, nine years ago now. Um, and it was intolerant of any statins. <coughs> um, uh, his initial LDL was uh, uh, very high, uh, and he got a re remarkable result. Uh, on uh, uh, Ali Rokhamad. And so uh, uh, in summary, uh, uh, reduce the ASCVD risk with uh, cost-effective uh, lipid lowering, uh, promote a, a healthy lifestyle. Uh, uh, we should expand the use of high intensity generic statins. Uh, it's currently underutilized and, and uh, uh, I think we would uh, benefit a lot of patients if we did that and then prescribe the newer agents uh, when, when the statins are inadequate uh, or, uh, and especially for patients at the highest risk uh, of major adverse cardiac events. Um, and so with that, I thank you very much. And I leave you with some advice from Boston for the pandemic.
Dr. Shulman, thank you so much. Um, you. We really appreciate you sharing your expertise with us. And we're gonna go ahead and move on um, to the Q&A session. Thank you uh, for people so far entering things on the Q&A icon on your, on your Zoom toolbar. So we're gonna start off with, how do the SGLTs affect foot ulcers and circulation? Um, okay, so with that, um, the bottom line is unknown. Um, fortunately, it's relatively uncommon, but um, one of the concerns with the SGLT2 inhibitors is that it can reduce volume. So you want to make sure patients don't get volume depleted, and maybe that has a role with it, but um, the, it's, it's not exactly known. But the main thing is avoid use of those drugs in patients who look like they are at high risk for diabetic ulcers. Great, thank you. A recent article suggested the possibility that ARBs or ACE1s may cause renal cell proliferation that may contribute to kidney damage. Opinion? Um, well, with that, what is known is that you can have a transient bump in creatinine with the ACE inhibitors and the ARBs, um, but you know, you monitor it. So when you start someone on it or increase the dose, you want to check maybe a week later, uh, EGFR and serum potassium to make sure they're okay. I've heard nephrologists tolerate a slight elevated um, potassium. Clearly you want to keep an eye on it, but the bottom line is the outcome data are good. And so if you have patients with hypertension, that's why with diabetes, it's really that and thiazides as the quick go-to medicines for um, treatment of hypertension because um, people end up doing so much better. Thank you. Is um, diabetes mellitus 2 considered to be equivalent to already having an MI? How can a patient with diabetes be considered not a candidate for a statin? <laughs> um, the 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 idea that the diabetes is a, a coronary disease equivalent comes from the older guidelines uh, uh, dating back 20, 30 years. Um, uh, the recommendations are for, are for diabetics are, as, you, as uh, uh, you, I've shown, um, so most, most diabetics uh, over the age of 40 anyway um, uh, will, um, uh, should be placed on a statin. Great, thank you. Leave it at that. What is your experience on how to obtain the more expensive medications without undue staff time for patient assistance programs? Uh, <laughs> uh, there, there's a, there's a website called Cover My Meds, I believe, uh, mm -hmm. that I, that our medical assistants have used to try to uh, uh, get prior authorizations um, 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 for, pay, for uh, drugs which uh, haven't been, have not been uh, uh, covered. Um, uh, one, one thing uh, uh, is that uh, uh, with, with uh, well, I'll just, I'll speak about the, the PCSK9 inhibitors. Um, uh, if you can show, uh, and it shouldn't take long to do this, that the patient is statin intolerant uh, you know, list two or three statins that the patients already had and, and had inadequate um, uh, effect of either statins or zetamide or, or, or the combination. That helps to get PCSK9 inhibitors covered. Great, thank you so much. How do statins cause diabetes in metabolic syndrome? I'll pass that one to Craig. <laughs> right, right. Um, you know, again, the answer is unknown um, uh, in terms of pathophysiology. But as Dr. Shulman said, the incidence of diabetes is very low with statins. And these are patients who tend to be on a pathway anyhow. They're often with risk factors, obesity, prediabetes, et cetera. And again, the outcomes are better. No one ever wants to get diabetes or cause diabetes, but patients on statins, even with diabetes, do better. And so um, it's getting them recognized on treatment, monitored, and uh, you've done them a great service. 
Thank you. I agree. I, I agree with your recommendation. <laughs> Any advantage of prescribing statins in lupus patients that have no diabetes or hyperlipidemia? In lupus patients? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not aware of specific recommendations for, for those patients. Um, they might be at increased um, uh, risk for uh, uh, ASCVD uh, because, of the anti uh, because of the inflammatory nature of their condition. So I would consider that, I think, I don't know if it's, it's listed I, I, uh, in, in the, in the uh, inflammatory diseases uh, that, that are, are, represent risk enhancers, uh, but I would consider it as a risk enhancer and then use that information along with the, the ASC, total ASCVD risk. And again, a, um, uh, um, a shared discussion uh, with the fat, with the patient, uh, him or herself, is is uh, needed. Great, thank you. I have some patient. Um, I have a patient uh, with a ten year cardiovascular risk of less than seven point five percent by calculator, yet their LDL is one hundred and forty to one hundred and fifty. How do you manage this? I, I start with uh, uh, non-pharmacologic measures. Um, uh, how old, uh, you know, part of it depends on how old your patient is, but, but if the risk is less than seven and a half percent, I would guess uh, that, that the patient is less than, less than 60 years old. Uh, the reason I would guess that is because the risk uh, estimator is heavily dependent on age. So the, uh, over the age of 65 or 70, particularly for men, uh, the, the risk is, is, is much higher than that. Um, uh, start with uh, lifestyle uh, modification. Is there, are there risk enhancers? If there are risk enhancers, take that into account. Um, uh, uh, and uh, uh, after, all, uh, after all that, uh, discuss, it with the, discuss it with the patient, although you, know, you can't, um, uh, uh, you can't really re make a strong recommendation for a statin if the, uh, if the patient is, uh, has a risk of under seven and a half percent and does not, does not have any of the risk enhancers. Oh, yes. One, one thing you can do to try to help you decide, and that is obtain a, uh, a low dose chest CAT scan for coronary calcium. If the coronary calcium is zero, the patient has no current evidence of um, uh, coronary disease. And uh, in that case, you can actually de-prescribe statins unless they are diabetic, hypertensive, uh, or uh, cigarette smokers. Thank you. We're gonna take these last two questions from Shakira and Brittany. First, how high should the transaminases be before you would stop consider, before you would consider stopping a statin? Um, uh, the answer to that is, as you know, close to 10 times the upper limit of normal. Uh, we almost, almost never, almost, I mean, I haven't seen that in, I don't know how many years. Uh, and I've only seen, uh, that level of, uh, um, uh, enzyme rise in people who had rhabdomyolysis for other reasons. Um, uh, so, you know, uh, uh, I suppose I would uh, consider uh, either lowering the dose or, or stopping it uh, once the uh, uh, enzyme levels get to five times greater than the upper limit of normal. Thank you. This is a transaminase rather than CK, I think it was asked. Uh, transamin uh, uh, transaminase rather, well, uh, again, it depends. It, it seems to me it depends on the level. You know, if you have two or three times the upper limit of normal, you're probably fine. Thank you. Do you have a preferred GLP-1 that you use in practice? Um, well, in terms of GLP-1, um, people tend to avoid the short-acting one, like uh, Xenotide was the first one, but that's daily, so it's less convenient. Um, as mentioned, uh, I wouldn't necessarily go to the injectable semaglutide because of the risk of retinopathy. Doesn't mean it's an absolute contraindication, but 
move away from it. So any of the other long acting ones um, once a week, and then there's the oral semaglutide. It really comes down for a lot of patients what their um, availability is, the access and insurance company. Thank you. And this is the last, last one. <laughs> what is your take on patients who are between the ages of 35 and 40 with diabetes? I typically present their 10 um, ASCVD risk score as if they were 40 and go from there. I think that, that the emphasis is getting on, uh, you know, the last year or two has been getting on uh, uh, earlier and earlier preventive treatments. So I would agree with that strategy. Um, you know, again, depending on what the risk is. Great, thank you so much. Um, before we um, do our um, final remarks, I wanted to welcome Ruth Arnold Smarinski, who is a PharmD and the Director of Pharmacy and Clinical Affairs from Direct Relief. And I know Ruth um, just had some brief comments. Ruth, thanks so much for being here today. Well, thank all three of you and Dr. Bendow as well for being in the waiters there, but that was a phenomenal presentation. I learned a lot. I took copious notes and I'll look forward to seeing the presentation um, and a review, but thank you so much for doing that. I just wanted to say for those of you who are members of Direct Relief already, we try to get as many of these products in. Um, somebody had asked a question about how do you get these products or which ones would you go with? We try to get these available for your uninsured patients. Um, I ran a pharmacy at a large free clinic for many years. So I have strategies for that. So please feel free to reach out to me if you'd like to hear some of those strategies for the uninsured patients for it. But starting with the statin sounds wonderful. And frequently we'll get some products in that you can use that are the more specialized and expensive ones, which is a good opportunity to try those patients on them. And if it works well with them, go through the patient assistance program. We're always welcome um, and encourage our partners to let us know what types of things they're needing. Um, so please contact us if you need to. Thank you again. Fantastic presentation. Uh, two questions indirectly for you is, um, what is your email address if they can contact you? And then also how can free clinics get pen needles? Pen needles are really challenging right now. <laughs> I'm going to do that one first and I'll give you my email address. The pen needles, a lot of the issues right now are because so many needles and syringes by the big manufacturers for those were made for the COVID vaccine. So productions of everything else is sort of slowed down. We do have a agreement with BD that they on a regular basis donate pen needles to us and we are anticipating a shipment of those sometime within the next month or two. So keep an eye out for that on the portal offerings for pen needles. Um, my email address, and thank you, Dr. Engstein, you did a great job pronouncing my last name. It's a tough one, <laughs> is R, and then my last name is Smarinsky, which is S like in Sam, M as in Mary, A-R, I, N as in Nancy, S-K-Y, and the Y is like in yo-yo or yellow, at directrelief.org. Great. So thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Ruth. And I just popped her in the email address um, in you. the chat there. A huge thank you to Dr. Sidor and Dr. Shulman for preparing and delivering these wonderful presentations. Obviously, Diabetes, hyperlipidemia are, you know, two very important diseases um, and uh, appreciate you sharing your expertise with all of us. Um, Dr. Bando, thank you so much as well for supporting the Q&A session behind the scenes and also um, supporting the development of these talks. Um, to all of the attendees today, Direct Relief and Maven Project Partners, excellent questions that you've um, given us. And we also want to say a big thank you for all that you do working on the front lines, caring for your patients. Um, they're really lucky to have you. And we look forward to our next Direct Relief um, session. And I'm going to go ahead and share that with you. So there is a Vaseline Healing Project Dermatology Series on Dermatology Basics. And mark your calendars for Friday, February 25th, 10 a.m. Pacific Time, 1 p.m. Eastern Time.
with Dr. Jeanette Okoye. Um, and this is in partnership with Direct Relief and the Maven Project. So that'll be our February session. And then be on the lookout for more communications about the monthly sessions um, sponsored by Direct Relief for the rest of the year. I hope everybody has a wonderful weekend and we look forward to seeing you at our next session.